Hi, I'm Jackie Trahan. Connor Kanabi. Uh, Seth Wiesman. Paul Stapula. And we are the developers of the SOM Restaurant Recommendation Program. So the program is a two-part application. We made an app for the iPhone and a website. The iOS app it strives to recommend restaurants for users the same way that Netflix recommends movies. It sees where you've already been, and instead of just recommending restaurants that are closest to you, it's going to recommend restaurants that you're most likely to enjoy based on users like you. And the website is for businesses to get some analytics about their clientele, such as um, what days that they come in, the rate of new users, how often a user is going to come back, and just the number of customers that come in. All right, so the uh, big design goal behind SOM was the idea that user experience shouldn't be the same thing as user interface. We don't want buttons for the sake of buttons. In fact, downloading our app should be 90% of the work for our user. And so we need to track where our users go. That's how we recommend places. And so we could have gone with the traditional check-in route, something like Foursquare, where the user would go to the restaurants, uh, open their, pull out their phone, unlock their phone, find the app, open the app, navigate to the check-in page, finally check into the restaurant they're currently at, and order their food. That is eight steps to do a simple check-in, and really, there's only two things here the user really wants to be doing, going to the restaurant and ordering their meal. With our system, the user simply has to go to the restaurant and order their food. We're gonna do everything else for you. And so, on a high level, what does that look like? You download our app, and then you just continue about your day as normal. We're gonna keep track of the different places you go, where you're at, what time you go there, how long you stay, and we're just gonna store these visits on your phone. Occasionally, we're gonna send them off to our server, where the first thing we're gonna notice is, you know what, not all these are restaurants, we respect your privacy, we're gonna go ahead and get rid of those. The next thing we're gonna do is say, some of these are the same restaurant, even if they're not necessarily the same location, and we're gonna tag them as such. So the McDonald's on Business Loop should be the same as the McDonald's on Stadium. A McDonald's is a McDonald's regardless of which location you go to. Finally, after cleaning and tagging the data, we send it off to our recommendation engine, where your visits, along with every other visit for all of our users, are combined to generate your custom recommendations. All right, so we decided to do this on the iPhone, mainly because of the core location framework. So there's an API built into the core location framework known as the significant location change. And so the whole idea behind this is that if you move a far distance, uh, Apple will actually send a notification to our app, and so it uses a lot less battery life than constantly Can checking. You Oh, is that better? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so we decided to use a core location framework, and there's a significant location change API that tracks your location if you move a far distance, and which helps cut back on battery life. So uh, we actually came across a problem with this. With the significant location change, it uh, fires off randomly, and we wanted to check if they were at a place or a restaurant. So. Fortunately, over the summer, Apple released a seal visit API, which is what we're currently using. And so with this one, uh, the app doesn't even need to be running, but in the background, if it can see that you've been at a location for a certain uh, period of time, it'll actually send these notifications to our app in the background. And so then when we open up the application, it'll actually send all of these notifications over to our recommendation engine, which we'll check to see if it indeed was a restaurant. So the server is um, pretty much where the phone sends its visit information to. So the server takes the information, make sure it is a restaurant, is not a restaurant. If it is, um, we pretty much assign it a generic label name. So McDonald's is just a McDonald's, nothing else. Um, the relationship between the location and the name is stored in our database, which is written in PostgreSQL using a PostGIS extension. The extension uh, allows us to do spatial queries, which allows us to uh, give the closest McDonald's if we recommend the McDonald's to the customer. Uh, on top of that, if we come across a uh, lad to launch that we don't recognize, for, um, we use Google Places API, which allows us to verify it's a restaurant. If it is, we store it on a database, uh, and afterwards, for future recommendations, we can rec recommend that to our users. So this is our uh, database ERD. As you can tell on the bottom, we have restaurant, and which has a one-to-many relationship with place. Like I said before, McDonald's is just a McDonald's, um, but has different locations. So in the lock data uh, variable right there in place, that's where we store all the latitude and longitude. So that's where we grab the, the specific locations from. Um, the website is where we give analytical information to specific customers. So for example, Chipotle wants information on just 
it's a store, not a Chipotle down the street or a different town away. So using that, we grab analytical information from the recommendation engine, and using chart.js, we represent that in a graphical visual. visual. And using Twitter Bootstrap, we uh, style it for a nice visual experience. All right, so the recommendation itself is a Java server built on top of Apache Hadoop. Hadoop is a distributed file system. It's kind of the new big thing in um, machine learning and big data. And so the idea is it gives us two big benefits. The first, it's already distributed across many machines. So we can easily scale to many, many users as our app grows. The second is it gives us access to the powerful MapReduce data processing paradigm, which I'll touch on in just a moment. The other uh, big library used was called Apache Mahout. This is our main machine learning library. Everything else is really built on top of this. And so for every user, we have to generate a score. We need to be able to tell how much you like that restaurant. And so for every visit you've had, we're going to take the duration of that visit divided by the number of days since that visit occurred. So a visit that happened a year ago is going to count a lot less than a visit that happened yesterday. And then for each of those individual visits, we're just going to add them up. That's your score for the restaurants. And so inside of Hadoop, we keep track of users, restaurants, uh, timestamps when you went, and duration. So this is every visit for every user stored in the, sta uh, stored in the status store. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to map these based off user restaurant pairs. And so the uh, Bob McDonald's is different than Bob Taco Bell because these are different restaurants. But Sue went to Chipotle twice, so we have two uh, timestamp durations for Chipotle. Then we're going to reduce those down to scores based on the scoring algorithm shown previously. And so we're bigger numbers just mean you like it more. So Bob has a McDonald's score of 20 and a Taco Bell score of 15. He likes McDonald's just a little bit more than Taco Bell. Okay, so at this point, we've generated all of our scores for all of our users, uh, but how do we generate our recommendations for you? We use what's called a clustering algorithm. And so we cluster our users based on how similar they are to each other. So I know the users in this cluster have a lot of the same tastes, and the users in this cluster have a lot of the same tastes. But those two clusters themselves might be very different. And so I can say, you know what, the users in your cluster, you like the same things, I'm going to recommend you places that they've been in the past and have enjoyed. But we do realize people's tastes change over time. So we rebuild this model every single night based on the visits that we've collected that day. And so today you might be in this cluster, but tomorrow you're going to move over here, and next week you're going to move down here. You're, we're going to evolve your recommendations as your tastes change over time. So here, oh, right. Okay, so here we have the application, and if you don't have an account already, you'll go to sign up and enter your first name so we can greet you, your email that you'll sign in with, and then your password and confirm that password so you don't make any typos. And then you'd hit sign up. In this case, we didn't enter anything, so an error message is going to appear, and that will happen if you don't enter something or if the passwords don't match. Since I already have an account, I'm going to go ahead and click that I have an account and sign in. And you can hit sign in or click go. And so here we have the list of recommendations. And say I decide I want to go to Main Squeeze, I'm going to select that. And it has the name of the restaurant, the name of the location that is nearest to me, and then a map. And if you want to click directions, it's going to take you to the Apple Map application. Going to go ahead and close out of that and go back. And then if I don't want anything that's showing up here, I can click what else. In this case, we don't have any other recommendations, so this message appears. If we go to settings, we can change our name, change the password, or change the distance. Say I'm downtown and I only want to go one mile so I could walk. I notice that my name is not capitalized, so I'm going to go ahead and oops, <laughs> spell my name right and <laughs> capitalize it. And we'll click save and you can see that it updated my name. Now, if we close the app, all of this will stay up so I can do something else and it'll still run in the background and remember that I am signed in and I'm gonna log out. And even though we use everything on the phone to collect like what you actually like, it's not tethered to your phone, it is tethered to your account. So if you want to sign in to your friend's account um, that has better taste than you and figure out what we recommend them, then you can do that and nothing will change with your account or with your phone at all. 
and plug that back in. Yep. So, shows up. So right now I'm going to illustrate oh. the ooh, all right the <coughs> website for our business customers. So right now I'm going to log into Mr. Lakota, which represents Lakota Coffee downtown. And once I sign in, it will bring up to the analytics page. And here you can see that there's unique visitors, total number of tracked visits, and pretty much what that means is 47 visit of uh, 47 different customers visit Lakota Coffee 160 times. And here the first graph we see is the the dis, dis, the dis, distribution, sorry, of those visits. The Saturday, we have 25%, Friday, Thursday, 20, Wednesday, Tuesday, 10, and so on. Next is new customers versus returning customers. As you can tell, that returning customers, 35 of the 47 were using the app and this is the second or more time coming to that restaurant. Um, and new customers is six, so first time uh, going to this establishment. Um, and then now we have length of visits, which has some 15-minute uh, uh, intervals and it's breaking up to percentages. So 10% uh, of those visits lasted 75 minutes. And depending on what kind of establishment you are, this can mean a lot or a little. Uh, for Lakota Coffee, having someone stay there for 75 minutes is completely okay. But if you're at Chipotle or McDonald's or Subway, for example, you don't want your customers staying, uh, being there for 135 minutes. So, and then, oh, oh, sorry. All right, so. That is not ours. No. Okay, I'll just, okay, it's up. <laughs> um, so if we were to continue development on this application after this semester, we would first work on implementing frequent visitor cards so that users wouldn't have to carry a punch card around to earn rewards at the restaurants they go to most. And then we would work on adding coupons so a restaurant could encourage a user to select their option over another. And then just getting more analytics for the businesses such as what time of day people come in anything that we've any new information that we can gather from what your phone already learns about you uh, are there any questions I'll ask you the same question I asked the Univert team I mean you kind of alluded to it is there a business to be had here do any of you want to do it or want to pass it on to somebody else or sell your idea to someone who could take it the rest of the way I think possibly, I think if we were going to turn this into a business, I think the model would be a free app for users and then we pay businesses to provide them with analytics about their customer base and they could pay to send out uh, coupons and th other things like that. Um, whether or not it's something we're going to do a after this May, we're all going off to different cities, so I don't know if it's something that's going to happen at least at this point, but um, it's certainly possible. Just a, a follow up to that. Have you had a chance to try this out, this app out with any of your friends or other folks just to see whether or not they find that there's a compelling case by eliminating all those steps you talked about? Yeah, we've, um, we've had a chance to try it out with ourselves. We just finished very recently, so we haven't really been able to get it out to a, a lot of people to test out. But um, I mean, so far everything has seems to work out well. It's, you know, you have the app in your pocket and you don't have to deal with it because I think that's the big thing. The more steps you have a user doing, the less chance they have of actually going ahead and doing it. And so by saying download our app and forget about it, we, um, you know, we use it for every restaurant we go to because I just don't have to touch it. Other questions from the audience or the team? Roman? First off, great thing. I'm really excited. Um, and I might have missed, maybe somebody already sort of touched upon this, but um, you have to sort of first download and install an application for it to start tracking user data. Yeah. But as you, I think, may know, Google already tracks your location and has that stored and you can access that. And as a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure you could try and access that through their API if you get consent from the user, of course. Have you considered that at all? Do you get the history of movement? Yeah, I mean, that wasn't really something we had thought about. There um, you go. For us, yeah, thank you. Um, no, for us it was kind of, we just want a, uh, we're collecting a lot of information and people don't like that generally, um, which is why I kind of, I stress the point of, you know, we're going to get rid of all that information we don't need. And so I think one of the selling points of doing it ourselves is we're saying, look, these are the only, you know, three things that we're tracking. We're not, uh, you know, Google, I don't know what they have. You're consenting to that, you may, you may not, but I know, you might not consent to Google tracking something, but you'll consent to me tracking just these one or two things. Any other questions for the team? Again, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.